Uh, I'm Jack Mitchell. I'm a professor emeritus at the university and uh, spent most of my life, though, in public radio and uh, at NPR and then later at Wisconsin Public Radio. I think we, uh, this panel was, uh, I assume, conceived because of a lot of firings, of people losing their jobs in the last few months at NPR. Uh, we had uh, Juan Williams, who lost his job for uh, whatever reason. Uh, this followed by the news vice president of NPR losing her job. And then uh, the head of fundraising for NPR lost his job. And then the president of NPR lost her job. And this was all having to do with political uh, issues uh, and the where do we uh, fall in terms of uh, neutrality in an organization like public radio. Uh, I was there literally at the beginning, and one of the and I think it's important to point out that politics have been part of public broadcasting from the very beginning. The Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 was the last of the measures of the Great Society. It was Lyndon Johnson's plan, which gave us Head Start and the War on Poverty and other such uh, act. Uh, in initiatives by the government. Well, public broadcasting was the last of those, 1967, uh, and of course his term ended in the election of 1968. So it's been there. And I should say that in the beginning, public radio and television took their alternative mission, because they were there to be alternatives to commercial broadcasting, they took it quite seriously. And there was, in my view, uh, a leftish tinge to what, what happened. Uh, public television did programs like PBL, Public Broadcasting Lab, The Great American Dream Machine, Banks and the Poor, which were shows that were, uh, it took a, basically took a stance. And they were tended to be to the left. I was at NPR, and I can admit uh, that we were left, and we were. The, the, uh, it wasn't so much that we were biased in how we covered stories, but the, cover, the stories we covered were definitely leftish. It was partly pragmatic because we could not, for example, have a reporter. We couldn't afford it. We only had a few reporters. We didn't have anybody in Vietnam to cover the five o'clock follies at Saigon. We did, however, have reporters in Iowa City and the other places where there were great universities. So we covered anti-war demonstrations. It was just, and so yes, we covered what we did, we did fairly. But there was definitely the kinds of stories that public radio in the beginning when I was there covered were definitely to the left. Now, that has changed. And it, in terms of television, it was with uh, Richard Dixon. In, he was elected, of course, in 68. Public Radio or Public Broadcasting Act was 67, so barely did the thing get started and uh, Nixon became president. And he objected to a lot of the things that public broadcasting was doing, particularly television. He didn't really know radio existed, uh, like most people at the time. Uh, and, but TV uh, had, and he cracked down on it and tried and successfully to uh, neuter a lot of the public affairs programming in public television. Uh, radio kind of went on, and it was, its change was more, more gradual. And then finally, uh, with the Reagan administration, we had an ideological change, an ideological reason for cutting public broadcasting, that the government just shouldn't be doing this. With Nixon, he didn't object to the government supporting public broadcasting, he just didn't like what was on it. So there's a difference in terms of the controversy that has happened uh, through, these, uh, through these years. Let's see if we're mic'd yet, because I can stop talking as soon as, as soon as the mics work, and I'll just babble on until, until they are. Well, OK, we are here. Basically, we're asked by Stephen to address the question of whether, in these changing times, uh, public broadcasting ought to be more opinionated. It ought to be uh, uh, more ready to take chances, uh, to, to take risks. But before we get to that basic question, which you're here to answer, 
Uh, we need to go back and sort of get oriented as to where we all stand. And are they all working? Okay, good. Uh, so what I'd like to do is start off with our three panelists. I'm going to introduce them as, I, as they each uh, make their opening statement. Uh, and what we're asking at this point is, so what is the current status of neutrality in these, these organizations? To what extent are they currently, their policies and their realities, uh, designed for uh, neutrality or interpretation and, uh, and partisanship? How do they stand today? And our first uh, speaker is somebody who absolutely knows uh, all about that, and she certainly spends a lot of time thinking about it. She's NPR's ombudsman, Alicia Shepard. Uh, and she, her job is to respond and to listener complaints or praise about what public radio does. And in order to do that, of course, she has to pay a lot of attention. And she has to have some values there about what she thinks is good journalism and what isn't. So she uh, is the ombudsman. Uh, has been for what, two years now? October 2007. Seven, okay, okay, <laughs> four years now. Um, and she uh, has uh, say, made quite a name for herself in her, her, her comments. She also teaches ethics at Georgetown University uh, and uh, has taught at American University and the University of Texas. And she's written a couple of books. Uh, the, the author of the book, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, Life in the Shadow of Watergate, and co-author of Running Toward Danger, Stories Behind the Breaking News of 9-11. So in order to uh, begin, let's have Alicia sort of give us an update. Where does NPR stand on all this? Well, yesterday I was uh, at Wisconsin Public Radio, and uh, the, I said they should name my talk, uh, What the Hell is Going On at NPR? <laughs> um, and you know, ev everything stems back to this key date now that in, well, in NPR's history of October 20th, the day that Juan Williams, a former news analyst at NPR, was abruptly, in some may say, inexplicably fired for something that he said on Fox News on October 8th, uh, it was October uh, 18th. And you know, why should I be interested in what Juan Williams says on Fox News? Uh, but that's pretty much most of uh, the complaints I got about Juan Williams were. The relationship had really become untenable. I'm not going to tell you the whole sordid history. I've written many columns at npr.org slash ombudsman if you would like to know more about it. But um, Juan was not fired for what he said on Fox News. Uh, Juan, his relationship and his trying to straddle what his role at Fox as more of a provocateur and his role at um, NPR as an analyst, uh, the relationship just became untenable. And like what happens in many newsrooms, it wasn't dealt with. It kept growing. and. Uh, I would say that the management just snapped and said, that's it, I'm done. The day that um, I started getting complaints about what Juan had said on Fox, I actually wrote an email to the head of, e of um, the news division and said, somewhat snarkily, I will admit, in my role as de facto ombudsman for Fox News, I would like to bring to you <laughs> the latest. So it was an ongoing problem had been since I got there in 2007. Um, it was handled very, very poorly. It was one of those knee jerk, just, you know, I'm done, that's it, you're out of here. No, you know, phone call, don't come in. You don't fire one of your most high profile people over the phone after they've been there for 10 years. So that though was a mistake. Other management, other news organizations make mistakes. But it was a mistake that occurred in a very partisan, a wildly partisan culture. And the right exploited it in every way, shape, and form. And this is what the internal thinking at NPR is. My response to that was, you knew that you were operating in a political culture. <laughs> you knew that Fox News uh, you know, almost enjoyed using Juan Williams to um, antagonize NPR. Uh, so you should have thought about that. Uh, but I, I have just, I just want to sort of put this all in context, which, you know, Jack mentioned that NPR's history, I think, plays a lot of what's going into what's happening today. So you have 
you know, the history of NPR colliding with this partisan culture. NPR did start off as a leftist organization, as he said, um, and that label has never left it. Um, and in the last 15 years or so, it has become very mainstream. That's a goal, that's an intention. Uh, a lot of it happened under Kevin Close, who had spent 25 years at the Washington Post. He wanted NPR to be more mainstream. Um, he came in 1998, the listenership was 13 million. 10 years later, it was 26 million. But what happened was, uh, in my opinion, NPR had grown up in this love vacuum. You, when, you would, when I even got there, you say you work for NPR, oh, I love NPR. <laughs> And you know, I, th I think of it in some ways as like a teenager who uh, isn't comfortable with its own body and isn't aware of what its body can do. And that um, they, I do think NPR attempts to be very neutral, uh, but they just weren't aware really of their impact. And I think there's internally, uh, they uh, don't quite understand who they are. I think they do sort of intellectually, but the structure you know, they weren't prepared for the reaction to what happened with uh, Juan Williams. And it's, it's, it's a very uh, sad situation for someone. You don't take the job of ombudsman if you don't care about a news organization or you don't want it to do well. And, you know, they, they're, you know, I would say that um, in Ron Schiller, who was the ch chief fundraiser, you know, in one two-hour luncheon, which there was a hidden video camera sting, he managed to, you know, give NPR a huge black eye, totally demoralize his development staff, totally infuriate the rank-and-file reporters, and then throw huge slabs of red meat to Congress. I mean, it was quite a luncheon. <laughs> But our, our second speaker is also from public radio, but at the uh, regional level. Uh, Raul Ramirez is the news director of KQED radio in, in San Francisco. Prior to that, he's worked at various newspapers, including the Miami Herald, uh, the Washington Post, and uh, worked as an editor and reporter at the Oakland Times and the San Francisco Examiner. So there's a, a lot of... Uh, of experience there before he got to public radio. Uh, he did investigative reporting for the Examiner and uh, did reporting from around the world and his whole fistful of awards to, to recognize that. He's a former president of the board of the Center for Investigative Reporting and is currently an ethics fellow at the Pointer Institute. So I will ask Raul the same Question: what, What's our status now in terms of our objectives in, rea in uh, objectivity, balance, fairness, pol politics? First, let me let me sort of define uh, where my voice comes from. First of all, uh, NPR does not own any uh, radio stations. It does not own a transmitter. NPR distributes its service, its stories, through its stations such as KQED in San Francisco, Wisconsin Public Radio uh, System, and so on. Uh, so it is important to keep in mind that in some ways I am as much a listener and an observer of NPR as any listener observer around the country. Uh, but I, I, in, in, so it is, uh, as such, there is an interesting uh, a phenomenon that happens. We get the flack. When NPR stumbles, we feel it. People, when you are listening you, or watching television and something happens that makes you deeply unhappy, you will pick up the phone and call your local person. I am the local person in San Francisco. And um, he sends it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Eloquently, if, if too. If it's NPR. <laughs> uh, the, um, I uh, tried an exercise this morning, which I'm going to share with you. I went to my faithful iPhone. I have to, oh, it didn't lock, OK. And I looked at the NPR. We, every morning, I get a, an email from NPR with a lineup of stories for the day. And I'm just going to read to you the highlights of what NPR is covering today, both in Morning Edition and uh, All Things Considered, its two primary program services, and of course, newscasts throughout the day. Budget. House, House is expected to vote on Paul Ryan's 2012 plan, with possible updates and so on as the, votes, uh, uh, as the vote happens, and uh, uh, culminating with the E.J. Dion and David Brooks uh, 
doing their perspectives on all of this and analyzing and pontificating and so on. Libya, and a number of, a couple of angles or a number of stories on the situation in Libya. Uh, NATO and, Li and Libya, still Libya. Middle East, watching developments across the region assess sporadic protests flare. Um, meet the, um, Brooke Laston, this sounds interesting. Meet the John Stewart of Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> you go figure. Liberal? Maybe, I don't know. Um, Ivory Coast, watching developments. Um, uh, uh, Presidential palace tour somewhere, it doesn't tell me where, but somewhere there an NPR reporter is touring a presidential palace, you go figure. Um, soaps uh, scrub, that is all my children and one life to live are canceled and the nation mourns. <laughs> NPR, the liberal place. Um, uh, then uh, various hosts interviewing various people uh, on mainly, it's a whole cluster of stories uh, looking at Passover, with Passover primer, primer and so on and so on, a religious holiday uh, package. And then uh, online highlights is more of the same. I don't know what that sounds like to you. For me, it sounds hopelessly centrist. Uh, to me, uh, but again, I'm in San Francisco, which is sort of the Madison of California. <laughs> you know, gotta keep that in mind. Um, what, what is missing from this? Well, uh, there are a couple of nuances that are missing from it. But the first thing that is missing substantially is that you don't hear a whole lot of fulminating here. You know, pontificating maybe a little bit, but fulminating you don't hear, and you will not hear it, uh, certainly in, on NPR. The difference, of course, is in the treatment. Uh, the difference is in the kind of narrative and the frame that NPR reporters bring to their stories and that the editors bring to their assignment. Uh, it's a narrative that acknowledges uh, perspectives that collide and blend with all of their messy mixture. NPR reporters, as they go out to cover stories, and I know this, we have a couple based where I am, and uh, my own reporters do a fair amount of reporting for NPR. Uh, when they set out uh, to cover a story, they're not looking at one or two sources. They, lo they, they have a whole range of, of source possibilities as time allows and as the storytelling fr uh, a window may allow. So, so that, that is, to me, uh, as, a, as a news director and as a consumer of NPR, I find that to be one difference. Another one they said is a narrative that is urban. It tends to be urban. If you listen to NPR over time, now I live in an, an urban area, I always have. So I'm not sure that I know exactly what is missing, except that I know that there is a little bit of a tendency to miss out on framing that might originate elsewhere. Even though I think NPR tries, and we will get into some of that later on. But it is a narrative that is urban, and if urban means liberal, I suppose that that, uh, uh, that might be one influence. Um, it is, you know, I talked about reporting, a narrative that acknowledges perspective. It also acknowledges the complexity of issues. So that you, f you may find that NPR takes the time to deal with an aspect of a particular issue today, and tomorrow or the day after it will deal with a different aspect of it. Uh, for an individual listener listening to an individual story, you will walk away with the impression of a particular story. It's a balancing act, uh, a, a story only, and if you don't, people don't listen necessarily every day to everything that we air, as much as I try to make them do it. Uh, but it's, it's a balance that I know that I struggle with. Uh, at, at my local station. Uh, it is a narrative that increasingly is looking to engage audiences. And I think we'll get to that later on, so I won't uh, dwell on, uh, uh, on that. Um, so first of all, the story choice is not what the difference is. I think that there is tenor tone, um, the framing of questions, and I hope that we uh, can talk about that. Uh, in, a, in a few minutes uh, that do make a certain difference. Whether that, that makes NPR fall somewhere on the political spectrum, I don't know. Again, in San Francisco, the complaints, I, I rechecked myself yesterday, thinking, asking uh, our, our audience services folks and my own boss, uh, I know what comes my way. Uh, I have something called executive in my title. And that means that uh, you know, all that flows, flows not downhill, it flows uphill, and it ends up at my desk. And uh, so I hear, I get a lot of uh, listener feedback. Some of it is about what we do locally. A lot of it is about what NPR does nationally. And what I hear from our folks is, is more criticism about NPR being a little bit um, um, conservative. A little, now again, it is San Francisco, I acknowledge that. 
nevertheless, I, we don't hear a whole lot of criticism about the station being uh, liberal, which in San Francisco is a flaw as well because it's not progressive. You know, uh, so it, you you got to keep that uh, that in mind. Um, and I think it's, it's NPR does strive and strives valiantly to be a safe harbor, the kind of safe harbor that we heard about earlier. Uh, and whether or not we're there, uh, I, I, don't th I know that KQED is not yet. Let me tell you what I think is a, what is missing from NPR. Uh, and it is not, it's not along the liberal uh, conservative spectrum, but it's, uh, it's, it's about the spectrum of what America is and is rapidly becoming, particularly in urban areas, ironically, given that the, the framing of the narrative is urban, in my view. And it is a, a, moving to the second and third level uh, in terms of reflecting the diverse voices and diverse perspectives that are developing in this country. That certainly includes uh, uh, political uh, viewpoints, but it also includes life stages. It includes, uh, you don't hear voices on my station, either on NPR or on the, our local reporting, voices that reflect the struggles of uh, lower income people, you know. The politics, perhaps, but not the struggles, not the reality of the life, as frequently as we should have. I think we do uh, make an effort. I think we have a sensitivity to wanting to include that kind of range of, of, of voices. Likewise, you don't hear other uh, uh, types of, uh, of experiences reflected there. Uh, people for whom faith is a very important part in their lives may not hear on the regular programming uh, their perspectives reflected. On the other hand, you know, faith is something that is experienced at a personal level, even though in some situations uh, then religion is taken to a community level and to, and to a political level. Uh, so how do you tap onto that? Um, and so on. I, I, I'll sort of stop because I see the clock is, is moving uh, relentlessly. Uh, it's a problem with being a radio person, you're very much aware of it. Uh, but, but again, is, is, the, uh, is, the, is there a liberal bias to what NPR uh, presents? Uh, in San Francisco, there isn't. Okay, now our next uh, speaker has a perspective that goes quite a bit broader than public radio. Uh, Byron Knight was the, uh, well, he currently is the Emeritus uh, Director <laughs> of Broadcasting and Media Innovations for UW Extension which means he was in charge of public television as well as public radio uh, several years back when he held that position. But he's also been very active nationally, uh, particularly in public television. He's been on any number of boards. And for a period of time, he was actually working at PBS uh, on leave from the university to uh, help them get some projects going. Uh, Byron is now, uh, the co-director of a project funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting called Editorial, Editorial Integrity in Public Media. Well, that sounds like what we're talking about, <laughs> and this is why we uh, asked him here today. Byron. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm trusting Jack to put up a slide here, which is always dangerous. Jack and I have worked together for 30 no. years, and I am the visual person. Uh, he's the radio Where talk person. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always found that the visuals are something that uh, drive home the point of what we try to be. It's fun sitting here this morning with two folks from NPR, public radio in San Francisco and in Washington, because historically, public television is has drawn the attention of the media, of most of the pundits. It's been, since the Nixon administration, somewhat under attack constantly. We've revised, we've changed, and uh, so I want to thank them because now that NPR has stepped forward, it's not so much that way. <laughs> I think PBS right now is getting a little bit of a, of a breather. But the one thing that I think both NPR and PBS and all of our local stations would agree upon is that trust is our most important asset. Without trust, we don't have audiences, we don't have fundraising, we don't have a participation in our communities. 
And the one thing I know at Wisconsin Public Television and Radio is that we set out many years ago to be a trusted partner in this community. And I think that folks engaged in, in journalism and civic activity in Wisconsin would agree that that trust has been very valuable for the institution that Wisconsin Public Radio and Television has become. So I know that in many, many instances when I've been dealing nationally, it is the word and the idea that we have tried to present also to other stations and to our national organizations. It has become almost a brand. And if Jack will change the slide. <laughs> hey! <laughs> this is a poll that was taken recently, 2011. What? It was taken because those of us in public broadcasting wanted to show and demonstrate that the public trusted us. The green one, Jack, the green one. <laughs> it was up there. It was for a second, yeah. It was for a second, here. Anyway, when it comes up, <laughs> you will see the results of the poll. And I think that it is uh, very satisfying and very real that people do trust public anyway. broadcasting. Click on the green click slide. Click on the green one. Yeah, that That's it. it. Yeah. Whoa, click on it again. There you yeah. go. 44% of those that were polled were asked the question, of these uh, media and governmental agencies, organizations, which one do you trust? 44% said that they trusted public broadcasting. In this case, it was specifically PBS, but I have no problem extending that to NPR and public radio, because I do believe we are seen as a single entity many times. And you can see how the others come down. Now, what does this mean? In a world of uh, issue-oriented, however you want to say it, partisan media, the niche, I believe, that we have carved out is one of public trust. And I hope that that is, is in fact, uh, the case, because it is very important to us. We, I wanted to mention the, the we talk about partiality and impartiality. In the PBS mission, it says, by guaranteeing our programs treat complex social issues with journalistic integrity and compassion, our audiences know they can rely on us to provide accurate, impartial information. So if the question is Jack will pose, I think, here in a minute, is should we be more partial? Should we take sides in the debate? Should we fall somewhere between uh, MSNBC side or Fox News side? I think the answer is if we are going to continue to be who we are, we must maintain the public trust. Thank you. OK, well, let's go on to that question. Uh, the, the issue really is, OK, given where the three panelists think we are, uh, what is the ideal? What should we? public broadcasting, how should it regard its partisanship? Should it be down the middle neutral? Should it be a forum for all kinds of ideas to be thrown around? Uh, should we be uh, looking, investigating, and providing informed uh, opinion or informed uh, uh, interpretation of the news? What, what is it that would be ideal, given what we have? What, is this, what could we, should it be different? And I'm gonna start with Raul on that one. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that I know what the ideal is, but I know what it is that we're attempting to construct at KQED. And, um, and frankly, over the past few months, uh, I've become a little bit more aware of what's, what NPR's internal values are, which do not differ really from what you hear. By the way, I just, just yeah. neglected to mention that if there is a bias in uh, 
the presentation of, uh, of NPR News today and every day, really, it is you heard a lot of foreign news there, a lot of international news. And it is something that NP uh, NPR has chosen to emphasize, particularly as other media retreat from bringing us the rest of the world in a, in a, in a I, was, I was going to use the term balance. I promised myself I would not use balance today. <laughs> it's, it's phony, um, yes, it you know, in a diverse way. Okay. Um, in terms of what we need to strive for, we, uh, again, we, we sort of move to the, the processes that we use to, uh, for what we do. Uh, we, I want KQED and NPR uh, to be institutions that, uh, that, that verify, that probe, that ask in, insightful questions and allow for the answers to come from a range of perspectives. Now, that can't happen in every story at every time, but it can happen over time. And so long as we are continuing to strive in, the, uh, in that direction, we, uh, uh, we're doing well, I think. Uh, I want NPR and KQED to be independent. Independent of the influence of, of, uh, of funders, independent from political uh, whims of the moment. And sometimes it's tough. You know, sometimes it's, it's really difficult uh, uh, to remain independent. I want us to be comprehensive in what we do. Uh, that is to really acknowledge not only the nuances in a particular story, but the wider panoply of stories that constitute the face of America, the reality of America. Um, and I want us to retain a certain proportionality to what it is that we cover. By the way, I'm borrowing these principles uh, from learned journalists, you know, whom I've listened to. Uh, but they are the principles that we uh, that we strive to uh, to pursue. Uh, I would like to be to see NPR and KQED be, be much more interesting, and I think that we are becoming much more interesting in our storytelling, in the framing of stories. Uh, I would like us to be a lot more diverse than we are. You know, one of the difficulties that both NPR and KQED have is that our newsrooms, try as we might, continue to be uh, not as reflective of the, face, the faces of the communities that, uh, that we cover. In NPR's case, of course, America, and in our uh, case, California. We look not only at San Francisco, but we look at the, uh, at the diversity of California. Um, if we strive and sometimes achieve this, this, uh, these aspirations, I think that NPR and KQED began to become more of what I would feel uh, comfortable with, and as my career, uh, such as it might be, sort of reaches its final stages, something that I could look back on and feel that we've accomplished a, a good deal. Uh, is NPR there? Not yet. Uh, is KQED there? Uh, no, uh, not, not yet either. Uh, but again, I, we, we, don't talk this, we don't talk about left and right uh, really in, in, in our news meetings and in our newsrooms. But we talk about the relevant perspectives in a particular story, being aware that there is a left and there is a right and that people tend to look at it, but being even more aware that between L and R, or I guess progressive and R, uh, there is the rest of the country. It's the rest of our audiences, it's the rest of our communities. And that we need to hit those, those points as much as possible because ultimately that's where a lot of the wisdom is to be found. Alicia? Well, I have to um, challenge what Raul said about it appearing that there may be a bias in foreign news. Um, and I feel that I deal with this a lot. NPR covers what's happening. And right now, Libya, Tunisia, Japan, uh, you know, what's, the list goes on. I mean, foreign news is news right now. I mean, so this is something I counter, I get a lot in terms of, uh, you know, too much coverage going to the Republicans. Well, right now the Republicans are making a lot of the news, uh, especially since John Boehner became the um, House Majority Leader. So sometimes, you know, you can, I could do a story count, I could count the number of Republicans and Democrats on, but that doesn't take into consideration what is going on with the news. I think if there's a bias, it could be that the stories are very DC-centric because NPR is located in DC, and I totally agree um, that they're very urban-oriented as well, although there is one rural reporter who is based in Salt Lake City. Um, uh, <laughs> And, you know, one of, one of an NPR statement of principles, um, they say that they're, you know, they want you to be, you must be fair, unbiased, accurate, complete, and honest. 
and, you're, and conduct yourself in a way so that there's no in question about the independence and fairness. And when they talk about fairness, and this is what I hope all journalists would be interested in, is to present all important views on a subject, not just two views. I can't stand hearing, well, both sides got covered. It's life is much more um, complex. And, you know, I would say the diversity issue is huge in public radio. I mean, they're just, you go into many of the newsrooms, which I have the privilege of doing around the country, and there are not many people of color in those newsrooms. And that's, and, you know, NPR is working on that. That's one of, I think, the hallmarks of Vivian Schiller's tenure at NPR, was to really put a focus and, in fact, hire uh, way Keith Woods from the Pointer Institute to make that happen at NPR. Um, I have one final point, which is that uh, you can divide NPR li listeners or public radio listeners into those who just love and adore it and don't even listen to any of the noise around it, those who are sort of, you know, committed and will donate, and those who are on the fence and those that hate it. And it seems to me like in many cases the loudest drunk in the bar, and I'm not equating that, but who gets the attention? Uh, it, is, it is the people on, you know, from the right spectrum who, and, and to me NPR reacts too much and is too concerned about them, and then they get the attention and uh, that you know, to me, it's like just focus on what your mission is and don't listen and don't get caught up. But be aware of them. I mean, every time now that we, any of us, send out an email, you have to be imagining that email on the front page of your local newspaper. And uh, that's to me what, when I talk about NPR not having kind of grown into its body, I don't think that they've had this sort of big communication strategy and things happen and they react to them rather than realizing if we send out an email about attendance at John Stewart's rally in DC, it's going to get on the front page of Romanesco. It's going to be misinterpreted if you aren't clear about why you're sending it out. Nothing is private anymore. There are no such things as internal emails. Byron. Um, just to follow up a little bit on something you said, Jack, about public broadcasting being sort of the tail end of the great society of Lyndon Johnson in 1967. And as most of you know, most, if not all, of the other parts of that legislation have uh, no longer exist. And I think because public broadcasting came from that environment, that we are a target probably much more than, than we deserve to be. Uh, I think that we strive to be nonpartisan because that is our niche, that is our broadcasting niche. And when you're nonpartisan, you're looked upon as either conservative or liberal, depending on the partisanship of the person who's looking at you. And we receive a lot, and I know Raul does, and Alicia does, of emails and all saying, you're too liberal, you're too conservative. That, as we say, probably means we're doing okay. But I think as long as we are identified and part of a social movement uh, of the 60s, and that we have evolved, both radio and television, into a very professionally fine-tuned organization. In listening to Alicia, I think that PBS has probably been more sophisticated over the last 10 to 15 years about positioning their brand than NPR has. And NPR needs, will catch up. Uh, but we have been very consistent with who we are and what we do. And I think that sort of leads into what Jack wanted to talk about next, because the word brand is important to us. It's not simply a marketing word. It is something that we strive to have each of our stations and membership organizations think about as they go about their business so that errant emails aren't sent carrying the brand. Okay, Can good. I just jump in oh, and say, sure. I, I would disagree with you, Byron, in terms of why a, a, a public media is a target. It's a target because it gets federal money, 
And there is a broader philosophical question of whether in 2011, you know, that's a long time ago that the Public Radio Act was, crea uh, Public uh, Broadcasting Act was created, you know, whether or not public funds should go to public uh, news, uh, TV, and radio. And, you know, and then in light of a $1.6 trillion debt, that's another way of looking at it. The political aspect is, is just one part of it. I think that there's a bigger question that is out there now. And whether or not it really serves the stations to have to go through this two-year, even though it's two-year forward funding every year, wondering are you going to get the funding for the next year and how much is it going to be? And, you know, and, and it is definitely, the funding is very important to a handful of stations. And I say that because I think only 75 stations, public radio stations, get 25% or more of their funding from the federal government. You probably get, what, 6% or? Uh, it's about 8%. 8%. Yeah. It's not insignificant, but uh, I think it's just a broader, bigger question that needs to be asked. Although, although uh, it may well be that it is because it gets federal, uh, federal funding, but the way in which it's articulated is sort of several philosophical approaches. One is government should not be funding a, uh, an enterprise that might be able to survive on its own. So on its and own. if you're talking about NPR, that may be true. If you're talking about the hundreds and hundreds of rural minority stations around the country, it's not true. Right. They won't survive without that kind of support. Right. Um, there, uh, there is a, I've been doing a little bit of research on, on the, on the, uh, on the rationale that is offered for opposing federal funding of a corporation, for, uh, funding of the corporation for public broadcasting, and another one is um, that it is too li that uh, it results in liberal uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, programming. Uh, but and, and another one is that uh, uh, we, that is Congress, should not be funding some uh, an institution that is going to be criticizing us, and that has been said. You know, has been said as a, as, a, as a value. So there are many different reasons. I do mm -hmm. tend to agree with you. It's being framed now in terms of money, but it was also framed in terms of money in the 1990s when yes. Newt Gingrich came out at a time when that was not, you know, it was, <laughs> the, the country was uh, um, doing a little bit better fun, uh, economically than we are now. Yeah, I think the debt is really the key reason why it's become this political hot potato. Yeah, although these were, say, under Reagan, yeah, the same kind of thing, but, but it they were didn't always, have the crisis, but it passed. But you know. I know within NPR's structure, they consider this the biggest threat that they have ever faced because yeah. of the looming debt. Yes, uh, and I might point out that in, uh, in Wisconsin, I think it's about 7% comes yes. from CPB, mm -hmm. but the Native American station up in Hayward, it's about 50%. Right. So uh, it probably wouldn't kill NPR or WPR, uh, it might kill the station in Hayward. And by the way, NPR, just for the record, gets absolutely no direct federal funding. Uh, they may give, uh, federal funds may go to KQED. KQED might use it to buy NPR programming, so there, you could consider that indirect. I think it's about 2% in grants, one-time grants that NPR has applied for. That are along competitive. With other parties, but it's not direct yeah. uh, funding. Right. Yeah. And, but the stations use some of that money to buy programs from NPR. The, the same is true at PBS. The money goes to the stations, then it's returned for the programs. OK, let's look a little bit forward. Uh, and the question that Stephen was raising is, what, what, what's changing in terms of the new technology with uh, interactive media, the internet? Does this change the equation in terms of what public broadcasting can be doing or should be doing? And since Byron is the Mr. Uh, media Innovations, uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with him. OK. I'm, this is going to be really hard, Jack, but I'm going to ask you to put up a URL, the one for... <laughs> okay, the editorial integrity in public media. Um, I, each public station in the country, radio and television, works to develop their own mission statements, their own statements of integrity, their own uh, policies about how they take money, what they use it for. Um, and there's a, there's a variation among the public broadcasters as to the way this works. Uh, in addition to that, there are now so many more platforms that we use to publish content that our broadcast rules and regulations that we've lived with for so many years, in some cases, are becoming obsolete. 
<laughs> I've been, for the last couple years, involved in a project called Editorial Integrity for Public Media, pmintegrity.org. <laughs> and we'll put the website for that up for a minute. But I, want, I, I wanted to go back. Just, I'll take a second while it's happening and speak to what Alicia said about debt is the reason for the interest in federal funding. I, I agree that that is the talking point and that is the message that is being put out there, but I do not believe it's the reason. I, well, it's I, one of them. It's I, one I, of the I reasons. I definitely don't right, think, you know. Right, but I think there are many other reasons. Yes. And speaking to all of those, we, in, a, in our funding uh, universe, as Raul said, the money, the federal money, may be less than 10% in many of the larger organizations. But with it, with that federal money, there is a, a feeling and, and a thought process of preserving the public trust, because it is public money. And I think the public money gives us an obligation for a public trust. And preserving the trust, as we have talked about, means that each station must be transparent in how it takes in its money, how it expends its money, what are the principles that guide the, the stations in what they do. So this project, called Editorial Integrity for Public Media, is one that is funded by CPB. The, the website is pmintegrity.org. It's funded by CPB. We realize, those of us that are old now, realize that we really hadn't updated our basic principles of public broadcasting since about 1984, when Wisconsin, a leader in the system, of course, uh, brought together a group of people in what was called the Wing Spread Conference, which was held at the Wing Spread uh, organization, and came up with some basic principles. Well, believe it or not, technology's changed, editorials changed, a lot has changed since then, so we took on the task of re-examining these principles and trying to update the language. We came up with uh, something we called principles of public media. And we put together a steering committee, some groups from public broadcasters, outside organizations, to really look at, uh, at some of who we are and who we want to be and how do we articulate it. So I'm not going to go through all this, but I just want you to know that this exists. It is an attempt to redefine and expand the editorial integrity principles that we have operated under for all these years into both new media and a new age of funding. I mean, the bottom line is we don't have enough money to do the things we want to do, to tell the stories we want to tell. We have to go out and find people who will support that activity who will help us tell those stories, who will financially help us. Then we have to figure out who these people are, why in the world would you want to give us money to tell this story, what's in it for you, and make sure that there isn't a what's in it for you, that is, this is not a paid project, that they truly want to tell this story and they believe that public broadcasting is the best way to do it. In order to survive, we have to have these transparent rules. We have to ask the questions. We have to be uh, proactive when we raise the funds to do what we do. And so uh, much of this is about fundraising and firewalls. Much of it is about our position as public broadcasters in new media. Uh, <clears throat> Twitter, you can write anything you want on Twitter. You can publish it right now. What I'm saying is being streamed many places, maybe people watching it all over the world. It becomes a public record of what we say. We, in the management of public broadcasting as 
my colleagues at NPR have learned have to be really careful about that. What does that mean to us? Didn't used to be that way, but it is today. And so we are trying to ask and answer questions about <clears throat> what is the employee's obligation as a private citizen to the organization they work for, especially if they are a program producer or a journalist. You can't just say anything you want because it reflects on the brand of what we are trying to build as a trusted organization. All those are questions that we're trying to look at with certain experts and we hope we'll come up with some best practice answers. Uh, these are, we don't intend them to be the Ten Commandments, but we do want our colleagues to be asking the right questions. Uh, Alicia, uh, how does the <coughs> new environment change things in terms of uh, how the organization should be operating? Well, one of the ways that it has dramatically changed things was the, the concept of, I mean, two things. One, the gatekeeper role is gone. And the second is uh, that appointment listening or appointment watching is also gone and that uh, NPR has realized that you have to go where the listeners are. You don't uh, just sit back and say, you know, tune in between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. to listen to Morning Edition. You have to be on the iPad, you have to be on the iPod, on the MP3 players, uh, streaming, whatever. And um, so you have to be available, but you have to realize that the same standards that uh, the high ethical standards that you would have on your legacy medium still need to apply to the web. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is this constant education of as younger people come into the new news world that, uh, you know, the us old veterans, you know, we know what the rules are, but uh, not everybody does. I mean, an NPR employee who was working for Talk of the Nation um, was dealing with Oliver Stone and, you know, had to bring him up to the studio and blah, blah, blah. And then he put on his personal tweet something derogatory about what a jerk Oliver Stone was. <laughs> you know, and yes, it didn't say so-and-so at NPR, but you, uh, you know, the question I think that's really uh, one of the biggest in journalism right now is, who does the ethics code apply to? I looked at you know, NPR's ethics code again before I came up here, out here, and the last time it was updated was October 2009, and it says that it applies to editorial employees. And I know yesterday I said I was at Wisconsin Public Radio and they asked that question, you know, who should it apply to? And my thinking is that if you work for a news organization now, whether or not you're an engineer or an assistant or someone in a non-news position, you still represent that organization. And the reality of 2011 is the mic is always on. We live in, in public. There is no such thing as privacy. And maybe you don't want to work for that news organization now but you know as Byron said um, I he says trust I say credibility is the only currency a news organization has and if you blow that then it doesn't matter how great you are as a reporter and so I think that this is a this is going to be one of the biggest issues now NPR um, actually as a result of everything that has happened hired Bob Steele from formerly of the Pointer Institute, to reevaluate its ethics code. Because one of the things that they learned <coughs> through Juan Williams was, yes, you have an ethics code, but the, it was selectively applied. And uh, so that's the question is you know, how, that it should be applied evenly to everyone, but and ev who is everyone? And does everyone <coughs> go beyond the newsroom? And I think it does. Well. Perfect uh, segue. Uh, I have worked on a 12-person task force led by Bob Steele looking at NPR's existing uh, ethical guidelines. And there are two sets of them. One that is primarily directed at the online work that NPR is doing, mm -hmm. and the other is, uh, is patched together, together from a variety of uh, uh, generations of NPR uh, guidelines. This task force, which met uh, over January yeah. and February, mostly with Vivian Schiller, um, before her departure, of course, um, uh, came back with a number of uh, recommendations that have been presented to the NPR board and well received, and that Vivian really was was a engaged in, uh, uh, in in. And one of the recommendations, by the way, uh, is that the NPR code needs to apply to a far wide that the ethical guidelines need to be applied to a far wider range of individuals, including 
the development, the fundraising people, including the individual <laughs> who unfortunately Ron is no longer an No relation. Um, to um, there are a number of other recommendations that have be become relevant to, uh, to the conversation I will add, uh, including the creation of a standards officer position that is somebody who would be a guru or even better, uh, better more accurate uh, definition, a rabbi in the newsroom who both management and uh, rank and file people could come to to discuss issues of uh, ethics uh, and including uh, clear lines between the role of commentators, in fact, taking the commentator role entirely outside of a newsroom, not taking the commentaries outside of a newsroom, but the role outside of a newsroom, and uh, a number of other recommendations, and that's all they are at this point. The board has accepted the report, but not adopted the report, and in any case, management will be the ones to do that. But let me quickly come to the question at hand, which is what, it make, what the, uh, the new environment, I must, uh, technological environment, makes possible, and some of the challenges that it presents, and I won't repeat what has been mentioned, which is, which is really on target, but let me mention a couple of items that have not been mentioned. One is that as a result of our necessity, our need to move on online, to begin to blend what we do, uh, and we in this case is broader, it's NPR, it's KQED, it's most of public broadcasting, most of media, period, including public media, is that we have an influx of younger people into our newsrooms. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, um, most people, if you go to any conference, a uh, public broadcasting conference, or if you went to one four or eight years ago, <laughs> most people would have hair this color. Um, you, there would be a lot of us who are boomers and, and moving on, and uh, the influx of younger people was not really as, uh, as uh, strong as we might have wanted. We now have that. Uh, I still am learning to balance a laptop on one hand as I walk around, which uh, uh, some of these young, younger folks uh, do well. That results in a greater diversity of both perspectives and actual mm -hmm. presence in the newsroom, and I already spoke to that. Uh, it, it, the new technology makes possible great, much far greater interaction with our audiences, mm. and that is important. That is important in, in a variety of ways. Uh, it certainly facilitates our information gathering. We are better journalists today because of technological advances that have been made and we have adopted. Uh, it makes, uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it, it allows for instant feedback, which can be really problematic, but uh, we can go into that as well. It does allow for huge transparency. In fact, I should say allows because I consider it to be a positive thing, but some people consider it to be a real problematic thing. Twitter. Uh, Facebook, should my Facebook page allow me anymore as a journalist to express myself to my friends and family and, and others and my, all the friends I friend uh, mm -hmm. to express my viewpoints on things? Well, I find my uh, citizen, uh, the exercise of my, of my citizenship is really curtailed now. I'm much more aware of the fact that what I post on Facebook may come back into the newsroom as some sort of allegation as to why we cover something one way or the other. Uh, it's a reality, it's a transparency that frankly I welcome, but it has an underside uh, uh, to it. Um, the new challenges include the urgency, the, the fact that it makes it possible uh, uh, to be very fast in what we do. And that is a real problem, because when, when we decide to be first rather than to be right, uh, just because we can update it the next, uh, in the next minute, if we should happen to be wrong, uh, it's a slippery slope. And uh, holding the line is difficult when you see everybody else going with it, going with the story, and we are holding back to be able to confirm something. Um, you, you have seen traces of it in uh, unfortunate events in Arizona, uh, uh, and you have seen uh, traces of it uh, in other stories that you may not associate with that uh, dynamic. Um, and finally, it's just the, the one emphasis as we distribute information online is really on the size of our audience. And there is a problem with that. There is a problem with going for the lowest common denominator. You know, uh, the fact is that if you have serious analysis of news and information, uh, it doesn't attract as much as, you know, send me a cute pet picture and I'll send it to all my friends. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily going to be sending to all my friends an analysis that really informed me and made me a better citizen. It's a struggle for us because we too are competing with other websites. Um, so I'll, I'll stop uh, there um, for now. Okay, well, I think at this point uh, we have a few minutes left. Why don't we... Uh, See if anybody in the audience has anything that I'd like to ask. Yeah, Scott. We just have five minutes, so it has yeah, to be just five everybody quick. 
Uh, it's too bad there's only five minutes for this, but it's a question I've been dying to ask, and I ask this as somebody who, as you know, Jack, started out in public radio. I love public radio. It's all I can stand to listen to anymore. But I've been asking myself this. Why is it in 2011, and Alicia, you, you uh, alluded to this, why do we need public-funded media? It certainly isn't because we need alternatives anymore. There's all kinds of alternatives on cable, satellite, the Internet. It's not because of independence. I mean, that's clearly, we, we've seen evidence of that just in the last couple of months. So do we honestly need you guys anymore? Just, I mean, to me, it goes back to the fundamentals of what the uh, public broadcasting was created to do, which was to really fill in the gaps in what information, culturally, politically, or otherwise, is filled in. Um, we have moved away from that, granted. Uh, but it is, that's one reason why it is needed. The other reason is the internet may be everywhere, but it's not in some of our rural areas. It certainly is not in some of our reservations and where Native Americans live. It is not in a lot of uh, Latino communities, although the usage is of uh, phones is, is growing in that community. And it is not in all low-income communities in terms of broadband. So in a lot of ways, the kind of analysis and information that public broadcasting uh, present, it would not be available in, in many of those uh, locations were it not because of a sole public radio station, in some cases public television. So that's my, my answer. And I would add that I have asked that question too. Uh, it, you, you even hear stations like uh, KCRW or WAMU in Washington, D.C. saying, well, we don't really need it, but the others do, which I, you know, then they've been chastised. Don't say that. We, you know. <laughs> But I, and so I, I keep asking the question, why don't, why don't the stations that have five, six, seven percent uh, try to get their funding elsewhere? I mean, a lot of times NPR would say, well, we only get one to two percent of our federal funding, you know, through competitive grants. And I'd say, well, then, you know, the reaction to that is anyone can shave off one to two percent of your budget. So, but the reality is, is the and Byron might be able to be, answer this best. But the formula is set is there's a formula of the way the money is distributed. Because in my sort of practical way of thinking, it's like why doesn't Congress get together and just say, okay, there's this pie, we'll make it a little smaller, and the stations, everyone that uh, Raoul mentioned, will get money if you need you know, if you're 25 percent or more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What? Let me try that one. Uh, yeah. 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 Go, Jack. Yeah, let me let's try it. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. We started off uh, as an alternative. Mm -hmm. As the media, commercial media changed, we, uh, there are certainly more alternatives out there, so there's less need for that, if any. Uh, but the question is, can commercial media, can you support something commercially that meets the kind of standards that public broadcasting tries to meet? And it's a really a matter of really much bigger question in terms of journalism as a whole. Uh, does it have to be subsidized in order to maintain quality? And I'm sure some people in this room believe so. Uh, and that's, uh, and if, if so, then public broadcasting would be the prime example. Uh, but it's different, it's certainly different from the way it started. Yeah, we have a question back here. I yeah, just wanted to uh, mention oh, sorry. one thing. Sorry. It would be very simple. The licenses that we operate under as public broadcasters are called non-commercial educational licenses. And they were set up as something different, the alternative that folks are talking about. Our basic public media principles don't necessarily rely on the funding, but they do rely on the accountability that is different. We create programs and information for the audience we don't create program and information to sell advertising. Yep. And that may sound really pedantic, but it is a huge philosophical difference. Okay. Question Hi, right here. Yeah, um, yeah my, my name is Tony Berman with Al Jazeera, and I'll have a chance in a few hours to talk about Al Jazeera. But I, I'd like just to comment on the question. As a, as a Canadian, as someone who spent more than 30 years with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I now happily live in, in D.C. and Washington. But I, I find that question as why would the United States of America have a publicly funded kind of broadcast system a really crucial one. And I, but I find it strange that it has to be asked, to be perfectly honest. The United States of America is the only industrialized country that does not have a developed public broadcast system. Uh, and I think that on something, for example, 
in reference to uh, international coverage, the United States right now has fewer than 100 foreign correspondents, NPR aside, has fewer than 100 co foreign correspondents attached to mainstream news organizations. A country of 300 million, arguably the most important country in the world. That is pathetic. You know, I think that public broadcast systems, not only in Canada, throughout Europe, obviously in Britain, um, actually fills the vacuum that the commercial system leaves. And I think that if one wants to look at the limitations of a commercially uh, a motivated broadcast system, and I, I really pick up on the remarks made just a few minutes ago by Byron, you, you would look at the American model. You know, the Americans, and I say this with great love and affection, and I now live here as, as part of America, are the most, in terms of broadcast media, which is the dominant media for the time being, let's not overrate the, the internet, is the dominant medium in terms of information conveyance, is the most impoverished country in the industrialized <laughs> world. So I, I think one day it would be wonderful to have a major debate on it. All right, we're about out of time, so uh, I'm going to thank our panel, and I'm sure we'll be out and about during break time to uh, catch up on more. You know, the other thing is commercial radio.